Hello and welcome to RE7 Talks today with an international guest from the UK, Amy Hopper. Welcome, Amy. Hi, thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure. So today's topic is resilience equals performance equals well-being, the blueprint for agencies. Um, first of all, before we dive in into the topic, tell me about yourself, Amy. What are you doing? Um, and maybe something that um you are passionate about it <laughs> so uh, hi everyone i'm amy hopper i am the founder of toa group we're a mm -hmm. performance consultancy based in the uk um looking at the angle from well-being but before that i was very much in agency world i used to run a search agency which i founded in 2013 and sold in 2021 okay. Oh, something I'm passionate about, uh, d d hiking. <laughs> We've had lots of conversations about hiking, haven't we? So yeah, definitely passionate yeah, about hiking, yeah. um, reaching peaks and, uh, I don't know, walking back down again. <laughs> yeah, it's somehow also some grounding, I guess. Yeah, to oh, dive sorry. into the topic. Yeah, hmm. uh, to dive in into the topic, re resilience, performance and well-being. Um, I mean, we discussed in advance a bit about the title and then you came up with this. Can you speak a bit about it? What, what is behind that? So for me, uh, when we talk about resilience, whether it's personal resilience or whether it's resilience within your business, resilience mm -hmm. within your teams, it all comes down to the base of well-being for me. And yeah. for me, the term well-being has sort of been bastardized. Um, it's not a term I, I enjoy using because it's it's sort of been caught up and it means everything from doing a bit of yoga to drinking green tea to, to self-love yeah. to going to the gym. Yeah. <laughs> when actually what we're talking about is making sure that you are able to look after your own emotional regulation personally and also at work so that when challenges are presented to you whether that mm -hmm. is you as a director as an individual as a team as a, as a leader that you're able to tackle those head on take a step back practice self-awareness and see where the, the the key the key points are in order to mm -hmm. move forward and actually accomplish your goals i see i understand i understand so can you give me some some examples um i mean i i know you did i mean we met each other first in in london and then yes. we had a small talk and you told me about a study that you are doing now. Maybe you can give me some insights of the study because I've heard you interviewed a lot of other um, businesses or agencies. For sure, for sure. So mm -hmm. before before I went into marketing, I'm, I'm a sociologist by training. My final thesis was okay. on the, so the final thesis that it was on the, the sociology of work and alienation mm -hmm. within the work. So it's very much about the, the relationships that we have within the workplace, the interconnection, the communication, and, and how those transmit to having a, a, a successful work-life, successful personal life. Mm -hmm. So for us at TOA, what, what's really important is that we're constantly seeing what's happening, what's happening on the ground, and whether that be in a certain industry or, or certain business, and mm -hmm. what people are really, really experiencing. So every quarter we'll do sociological research and that is us sitting down face to face with directors with owners with people with teams mm -hmm. and actually conducting interviews to find out what's going on and this quarter we had a look at agencies and uh, there was a range of digital agencies um, software houses tech companies and sat mm -hmm. down and discussed like what is happening? Where are the challenges post COVID, remote work, hybrid work, uh, new teams, new generations, what's, what's going on? And for us, it's because we don't want to rest on our laurels and think, oh, well, you know, we're qualified, we know what we're doing. Everything yeah. is changing. We want to constantly be adapting our business and our workshops so it makes sure that we're helping people as much as we can. So what were some, some insights that you experienced? I mean, um, I, I remember you mentioned to me when we were speaking, I have an, the agency in Romania, but you said there are some differences, for example, between the American, the US industry and, um, for example, Europe. Can you give some examples? What, what did you figure out? How, how is it different? 
Yeah, for sure. So the the main there are some differences, but we actually found that there are a lot of common threads, a, hu a huge mm -hmm. amount of common threads. And this is whether you're talking about agencies within the UK, US, Europe. Mm -hmm. um, lot, we spoke to huge agencies that sort of expand globally and have centers in the Middle East and, and all the way through to sort of your 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 two person, three person, five five person agency. And the two common mm -hmm. threads we saw that are the, the key sticking points are communication and confidence. And those we've identified those as the, the two main challenges, I suppose, because every single issue that seems to be coming up mm -hmm. for a lot of these agencies sits under those two brackets so for example you've got uh confidence confidence mm -hmm. on on new team main members coming in we've got um mm -hmm. imposter syndrome coming up in in some team members we had i've got written down here like this this idea of of perfectionism it was quite a common thread of, of particularly for agency owners when they're wanting to grow and they're wanting to delegate mm -hmm. more, but then there's this perfectionism sticking point, which again comes ah, up. Yeah. You know, <laughs> you know, I, I know what you're talking about, and then this <laughs> micromanaging comes up, you know? My, yeah, micromanagement comes up, and then we've got this okay, well, with a lot of agency owners that were in the position where they want to grow, we've got this pro like wanting to implement processes on one side. And on the other mm -hmm. side, you've got the issue of micromanagement and perfectionism. And all of all underlying it is, okay, you need to have better communication with the team. And so everything so, sort of comes comes underneath and produces a, a situation in which an agency might be stagnant or it can't go over a certain level or it, it's it's not able to grow, not able to bring in um, yeah. new, new clients into that into that sales funnel. So very, very interesting that even if it's a situation where you think, oh, well, I can't, I, I'm not bringing more into the sales funnel, I'm not able to grow, it mm -hmm. still mm -hmm. comes under a well-being issue of a lack of communication within the team. That's, that's really that's, that's interesting. Really I mean, communication, I would have said, yeah, I, I know about it. I've heard so many times. I'm aware of it. But confidence wasn't honestly on my list. But um, you, you have a valuable point there, I think, because um, when I'm thinking of team members that joining my team, for example, they, they don't have so much confidence. They don't know the people so much. So maybe they are just junior and they, 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 they're starting and they are maybe not as confident as um, the others. Or um, I can see this, for example, in my agency um, by myself. They come directly from the university and they never had communication directly with a client of mm -hmm. course um, there needs to be confidence to be built up um, in order to be confident to have client conversation because as you know clients can be really nasty and even then mm -hmm. they can ask really hard questions and if you are just started your career um, maybe you 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 don't know the answer and then you you don't know what to say and um, for us um, that we are long in business, we know we can say, yeah, um, that's a great question. Let me come back. But for yeah. somebody that doesn't have the confidence, they might say, oh, honestly, I don't know. And yeah. of course, the client is then like, I think it's an expert, so they should know the answer, you know? Yeah, yeah. I think it was as well. I mean, they, that's a really good point about coming back to a client because quite a few of the agencies we spoke to, they have that, that they don't have the the developer or, or whomever's doing the work talking to the client directly, they've got a project manager or they've got a client manager. And you're quite right in that uh, sometimes the, the the lack of confidence and again, com communication challenges mm. means that you might get into a situation quite often as, as, we, as we saw that the client asks for something that is technically out of scope and that inability to say no or be confident enough to say no They'll, they'll say yes, it goes back to the team, the team can't do it, and then it creates this, this animosity between project manager, team, client who's not getting the job done, um, yeah. and, and a flow that stops, which ultimately, at the end of the day, we're talking about something that's going to reflect poorly on the bottom line of the company and whether it can grow and, and, and the profits that it's making. Yes, yes, exactly. Another example that you just brought up with the um, design of things. Can you, like on a Friday, on a Friday afternoon, could mm -hmm. you do this today? That would be really great. And then 
they are just saying, yeah, we can do this. And the entire team is under pressure and probably also pissed because it's Friday afternoon. They want to uh, wrap up things and go into the weekend. Um, there are so many things. I mean, it's mainly, it's, I guess it's mainly client conversation, but also inside um, the company the conversation. Um, but you also mentioned um, just to look more as at the owner a bit. I mean, you mentioned also at the owner, um, like confidence and so on. And if you come from an agency, like you did everything by yourself and from one mm -hmm. to another day, you have an employee and then you need to build up trust with the employee in order to, to trust them. And I think this is um, what you said with the confidence that, um, if you don't have the confidence to, to trust, to give things away and you always want to micromanage or you want to have things perfect, um, it's going to be really hard to grow an agency and also that the employees will stay in your company if you micromanage them all the time. Yeah, yeah that's, exa that's exactly right. And, and the thing is, is when I'm, when I'm working with C-suite teams or directors one-to-one, -one, the main thing, the main, the main sticking point is always this, this idea of perfectionism in terms of growth and delegation. And we have to sort of, we have to get to a point where that you're, you're, you have to be able to let go of the reins a little bit in order to build that trust up, mm -hmm. communicating being key with that. But other, but otherwise, yeah, that growth is going to be utterly impossible. And we say to, we say to, um, managers at the time we say who's who's it perfect for because it's only perfect in your eyes someone else could yeah. think that it's absolutely awful <laughs> so much better yeah, to yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, there's a brilliant brilliant book um oh, i cannot remember the name of it i was rereading it yesterday and it was an artist and he said that for for they were making pots they were um, doing pottery, making pots. And mm -hmm. they said to these, the group of artists, you got 30 days. And one, in one group, they had to make one pot every 30 days. Mm -hmm. And the other group, they had to spend 30 days making one pot. And in every single case, the top 10 pots in terms of their quality, in terms of how good they were, it was the group that had made one pot ev every day for 30 days because they'd been allowed to fail, they'd been allowed to make adjustments, they'd been allowed to see the process, they'd been allowed to change based on based on learnings. Whereas the the, the group that had spent 30 days making one pot, all of that, none of their pots were as good as the ones that had been allowed to fail and been and and put put one pot out that might not have been perfect, that might not have been great. Yeah. But it got through a process to the point where it actually was really, really good. So it's a it's a very interesting um, uh, metaphor for I think a, a lot of, a lot of businesses and challenges that the directors face when thinking about perfectionism and thinking about de delegating to their team. You're gonna have to let them fail a little bit. Yes. Um, yes. In order to, to think agree. about the the yeah the 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 long term goal is is the goal. Yes, in order to grow, I mean, you need to let them make some mistakes. Of course, um, that's what I'm also telling my team um, when we work with clients. Um, somebody needs to review. Otherwise, um, you can't let happen so many mistakes at your clients. But this is the way you grow. You can only learn from mistakes. That's why, I mean, I find really great like role plates with, um, mm -hmm. with the junior staff in order to to get them like comfortable with a customer conversation and they can do mistakes and then they get some reflection and they can learn from it. I mean, this is like a, a really good example because um, if you have every day the chance to do some mistakes, I mean, you, you can learn from this. The most important part is to learn from them. Um, if you do every day the same mistakes, of course, there is no, um, there is no progress, <laughs> but yeah. <laughs> Exactly. There was um, one agency owner I was speaking to uh, who had a really good, uh, who actually was the only agency owner that didn't have this issue at, at all. And okay, what did he I, do? I put, he, I put it down to his hiring process, the way that he hires his team. And before he hires anyone, he, he goes out to dinner with them. Okay. 
took them out to dinner and had and said he's someone that he he wouldn't have a good conversation with over dinner that he like if he went to dinner with them and he didn't enjoy it they wouldn't get the job regardless of of how how qualified they were so it was very much about hiring the type of person and making sure that they're proactive and a good communicator and had the right mindset um, and of yeah. course, they had the same sort of challenges that other agencies do, and 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 still communications internally with with the clients. But still, the personality of the person was more important to him than than the qualification, because those sort of things could be taught, whereas the the proactive attitude couldn't. Yeah, yeah, I, I fully agree. But I also guess he went to a lot of dinners. Then yeah, a lot of dinners. He's doing this. <laughs> I think mean, yeah, that's a nice amount of dinner budget. Yeah, I I guess I mean he will put it under recruitment, but um, I mean it's a great way in order to build. Um, if the personality is great, and I mean the person is motivated and so on, they can learn what they want. They can grow how they want. I mean we live in a digital age where you can literally ask all the questions to um, AI, to Google, and so on. Mm -hmm. So if somebody wants to learn and to grow. And they have the mindset and the personality for it. It's 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 possible even if they are just started into. But if um, personality isn't great and there's this lack of motivation, um, it, it's it's really hard in order to um, to have them as a team member that can bring value. Because there will always be some struggles, and that also leads then to frustration in the team and. Um, like then then we have exactly this this issue that you mentioned communication problems and um issues with the clients clients are not happy and it's like um a wheel that you can't stop i mean it comes back to you yeah i mean you've made a really good point there in saying that you know you've got you can ask any question you want but that's that's again why confidence is a, is in my list as as one of the key the key points uh in this in this investigation because you have to have confidence in order to ask yep. the question. You have to have yes, confidence yes. in order to to raise your points, and you you have to have confidence to as a as a new person coming into an agency to feel as though there is a safe space for you to be able to ask questions without you feeling as though you're going to be um, well penalised for it in or some judged. way. Oh, judged exactly, and that's why it's yeah. so important. That's why the, this com confidence and communication. Yes, although confidence is is in in a lot of aspects an individual personal thing, it's very much on the responsibility of the agency and the agency um, directors to create an environment which fosters learning and fosters um, curiosity and and gives that. Uh, just just environment to for people to feel as though they can ask those questions because those ultimately those questions are what is going to drive drive the agency forward and as we as we both know no no question is silly no question is stupid and it gives a great idea as to what your team is thinking yeah and i mean i also think lead by example if i don't understand things because i'm not a specialist in facebook and mm -hmm. so on I'm asking silly questions, but sometimes I don't understand. I mean, um, so that they can see, hey, even he doesn't know everything. He's asking questions. Yeah. I mean, this is like just just like that. Um, but I know, um, I mean, I know from my employees, for example, that worked in other corporations and companies. Um, it's not always like this. I mean, mm. just need to do their job. They can't ask the questions. They are afraid to speak to the CEO. Um, I mean, there there is still a lot of things to do. Yeah. Um, for me, it's also because um, I'm from Germany. I had an agency in Germany. I have the comparison to Romania. Uh, also, like in the Eastern European countries, there's still this, um, like, you can't do mistakes. You can't show that you're vulnerable and so on. This is like still um, a long way to go. Um, I mean, mm. for the younger generation, it's easier to implement, but somebody that did it like the last 20 years or 30 years, the same, mm. um, it's not so easy to change and to 
to adapt to the new to, to the new working environment. Yeah, completely right. And I think particularly in the age of COVID as well, in this new environment that we find ourselves in, I mean, so many agencies are, are remote first, which is great. And it's it's fantastic for so many, so many reasons. But at the same time, yeah. it does, it does make communication hard. It does make, uh, and at the end of the day, people are still people and we can communicate digitally in so many different ways but it's very, you still will get a different vibe and a different reaction from someone from seeing seeing them right in front of you. Um, and particularly when we're talking about um, processes or implementing processes in, in order to help an agency grow, mm -hmm. if, if they are all remote, getting your team involved in those processes, that communication and again, having them, having them involved in the creation of how what it's going to look like what the framework's going to look like yeah. is so so important a because you want to be in the collaborative stage of management which then when a change is implemented the team are much more likely to take it on have ownership of it and actually implement it but also because you're in if you're in that tell phase of just do this it's very unlikely that it's going to happen also it's very unlikely that what you have created as a as an agency owner is actually going to reflect the individual needs of the team and also how they work because you don't have eyes on everything you can't i mean especially with the remote work i mean that was as you mentioned it was a big shift and mm. it happened so suddenly and there you could see um teams that were already good in communication they they could sustain that but for others that didn't had a conversation uh, communication before like um like that like when they were in the office i think it was even harder to do communication um during COVID, especially because mm -hmm. of the tools and so on i mean there was also this you you needed to know how how to use the the tools that um were in place zoom and teams and other tools Exactly. And there is a, a couple of agencies, agencies that I was talking to within um, within Europe, within Eastern Europe. And mm -hmm. as, as you quite rightly said, yeah, there is still this idea of you can't show weakness. You can't talk about well-being. You can't you certainly can't talk about mental health in any way. You can't expose that that vulnerability um, it, for, for, for fear that you will be seen as that you're not good at your job or that you're not you're not capable and actually saying to those team members, look, I know you've got people dotted around Europe, but actually at, at, at ideally once a quarter, but even like maybe two times a year, getting everyone together and having a big team day and, and just being able to talk and realize that mm -hmm. there is a human being behind the email. That's so, so important to foster those relationships, ease communication and get people much more on board and much more involved in the process and the growth of the agency yeah yeah i mean um also with the clients i mean not only to to see um mm. the people in your office but also meet up with the people show your face um to build to build relationship with the client i mean if they only see you always on the camera and so on far away and they meet you in person it's it, it, it's it's totally different i mean it's still this is this is like the the essence of a good collaboration um the human connection for it for sure for sure yeah and uh, yeah it people do business business with people always they, they always will do yeah and now that's thinking of... <laughs> oh sorry karen no no finish your idea first well, I was going to say that that's, that's probably why, I mean, communication and, and also boundary setting and the importance of yep. saying no, these are, these are the most important um, and most requested workshops that we get within TOA. Um, yep. just, just being able to, to go in and teach, teach how to communicate effectively and how to, just, how to say no to someone without yeah. it being rude just so that you're able to manage workflow better and get a better understanding of what's happening with within the team so you're not getting people that are burnt out or taking on too much or or, or one team that has no work and another team that has everything it's it's um it's just something that we don't get we don't get taught we get thrown into life after school and and yeah. just like expected to find our own way and as you rightly said as you go through agency life and you get more qualified yeah we we 
we communicate better because we've had experiences and we failed and we found out what works for us. But imagine if you could just have someone come in at the beginning, at the beginning of your career and just teach you. It would just be a, a lot easier <laughs> and save a oh, lot. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, and that's, and that's what we do. <laughs> yes. I mean, I fully, I, I, I fully agree. I, I had the pleasure when, when I started in, into my career. Um, I, we have this concept in Germany. It's called um, Ausbildung. Mm. It's like a training, but it's for two and a half, three years. And um, I started at a big corporation, Deutsche Telekom, at that time. And the first four or five months, we were in a special place just for trainees. And we had our own teachers and each mm -hmm. of us showed us things. We had to do every week a presentation, for example, mm -hmm. um, just in order to learn the, the, the normal things or um, a simple thing like what I see nowadays still that people come from universities, they get Outlook and they don't know where do I check my calendar or how do I make invitations yeah. like basic things that we are so used to it and that was for me amazing that I had at that time when I did this training somebody that um, showed me the things or presentations I mean I know so many that are afraid of presentation but if you're doing every week presentation and then we had this funny game was power and karaoke like somebody was just coming a presentation they found on Google and said okay here you go five minutes you mm. have never seen the slides of the presentation and you just had to improvise. Um, but it's a great way and it's a fun way in order to to learn, to um, build up confidence, but also mm. to build up the skills to do that. And if you come from university and you start, I mean, it's great to have somebody that can learn you the things, what you just mentioned, because otherwise it's going to be really hard on on the way for sure for sure i mean what you what you described there it almost seems like a great example of immersion therapy where it's just if you're scared of something such as the presentation to just do it over and over and over and over again until there's until there's no fear anymore yeah and i mean i have some examples also in the company for example um my business partner alexandra i, I know when when we started and sean she was also afraid of presentation now she, no problem she goes in front of the people in front of the crowd is doing her presentation it just needs um training everyday training and then you can be a great example for somebody that joins the company and you say yeah i was like you when i started i was afraid of presentation i was not always like this i had also to go through the hard way and um yeah learn learn the skills exactly and that that's a really really great example as well is that you've got someone older sort of mentoring someone that is younger and again with remote work sometimes you don't get that you don't get that I mean I remember in my career like a, a, a huge amount of what I've learned is from shadowing and mentoring while I've mm. been in those I mean only for a short I started my first agency when I was 25 so it's only, <laughs> it only for a little time but um having those mentors and those uh, um older generation that can that say no 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 it's okay you can do this that this is this is just part of the process when you realize that when you're on that sort of that ebb and flow of your career and you're perhaps at a lower point and someone just says no this is normal you can go oh okay I can do that which is all just a part of building up that personal resilience and one of the greatest things we find when we're doing workshops um, internally is that mm -hmm. those com those conversations between c-suite team and directors and and juniors or, or or new new entries are so so important because you realize that oh these guys are having their own challenges these are guys are having their own challenges there's empathy that is created between the two which is so important empathy between uh, the 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 young the younger team members realize that oh no it's not all it's not all like rainbows and wonderful for the directors and actually yeah, yeah, yeah. they are they do struggle sometimes and they do have their own imposter syndrome and they do have their own insecurities and and both create a much better relationship a much harmonious relationship fostered under communication and empathy for each other's situation and realizing that we're all human and at the end of the day just trying to do our best 
Yes, I, I mean, I, I, I fully agree. And I was just, I mean, we talked also the last time when we, we had this initial research about this, um, this uh, Dunning-Kruger effect. Yes. That when somebody <laughs> comes um, learning a lot, um, it goes up really confident and on the top things, oh, I know everything. I, I see this all. Oh, yeah. And then they realize how hard it is fall in this valley of where they think, oh my God, I will never learn this. And this is like, um, at least how I see it in my company, um, where I see uh, the people that want to then stay and they say, okay, I take on the challenge. Mm. Or the people that say, oh, I, I want to quit. Or they're just saying it's not for me. But this is like so, so interesting. I mean, to see this um, effect in the company when they are so confident and they are telling me after half a year or I don't know, a year, yes, I managed everything. I'm so confident. I know everything. <laughs> yeah. We. <laughs> We talk about Dunning Kruger a lot when we do. Um, we have a number of imposter syndrome workshops, and yeah. uh, Dunning Kruger gets featured in, in those as almost like a, a sort of take on it being the opposite of imposter syndrome. Or imposter syndrome, you you know, you're actually quite good at your job. You're you're educated, you're experienced, but you don't think you are. And Dunning Kruger is the opposite, where you have very little experience. You think you know it all, and uh, <laughs> and. Uh, <laughs> And we, yeah, we call that Donny Kruger or, or sometimes just being an ass. But um, <laughs> <laughs> we, we've all, all had that ex experience or experienced someone. Um, we, we all know a Dunning Kruger. Especially sure. when these people with imposter syndrome and Dunning Kruger effect meet. And the one yeah. is so confident, and the one with imposter syndrome is like, yeah, but do you know that? And then they are like, I'm so confident that now I see they are not. I mean, yeah, this is exactly. um, interesting Interesting to spot that you just realize, especially when you have imposter syndrome, that you realize, wow, I saw, I know so much more yeah. than I thought. And that, that helps to build up the confidence when you realize, when you realize, hey, this human being that I saw on social media so often, and now I'm here asking this question and he doesn't know the answer, or you see he would have said the same that I would have said. Yeah. Um, yeah. And in, in um, that's why particularly when, when with a company comes to us and they seem to be we, we conduct the the discovery phase and we find that there seems to be a lot of underlying imposter syndrome. It's normally something that is very, very common in high performing teams because they're so hard on themselves they're very, very highly educated. They might be from a red, red brick university, Oxford, Cambridge, and they've gone into these high, high powered roles in which they have a lot of responsibility. Imposter syndrome generally tends to be quite quite common amongst amongst the whole team and one one exercise that we do is really important we get people to sit down and talk about when they've when they have felt like an imposter against someone else in the team mm -hmm. and we did one for virgin o2 and there were two of the directors there having a conversation with each other and both of their example of when they felt their imposter syndrome the most that month had been exactly the same at wow. the same time towards each other so one so what exactly so one person had been, had been listening to the other person talk thinking oh my god this he's so great he's so brilliant i feel like an mm -hmm. imposter in my role and then when that person spoke this person has felt like an imposter in his role thinking oh my god he's so brilliant he's so great he knows everything so they were making each other feel like <laughs> while having the same conversation competition yeah yeah and and it was and it wasn't it wasn't no it was quite it wasn't competition it was quite endearing it was quite oh this person is so brilliant like i feel like i need to get up to this this level because they're they're so fantastic at what they do um and it was just that having that communication and creators in, creating a safe environment in which they could have that conversation fostered this 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 really quite beautiful moment in both they both realized the the respect they had for each other and actually that they both felt felt the same um yeah. and it, yeah and and everything kind of dissipated and they were able to move forward so it was a really again communication having these conversations why they're so in, so so important um, otherwise, they could have gone on feeling that way about each other and, and never known it. 
Yeah, yeah. I was just wondering, um, and you did your research and so on, imposter syndrome. And, um, did you find a difference in gender that, uh, for example, female have something more than male and the other way around? Did you um, spot some? Because for me, I just have a small agency. For me, I, I think I found some differences, but I wonder, I mean, you did probably a much greater inside talk with much more agencies. Is, are there some differences? Yeah, there's definitely yes. some, yeah, some definitely some differences. And mm. particularly, um, I mean, I've spoken to a male and female agency mm. owners and also have many yeah. different mixes within their team. And I think many were, um, did had noticed, some hadn't, some had noticed differences um, in gender. Thing. And we have to be maybe a little bit careful in that it, I think the imposter syndrome affects everyone. Yes, at, yes, at yes, any time, yes. everyone. But it may be perhaps that um, women e express it more, show it more, or shows more in their confidence, or they seem to show a more of a lack of a lack of confidence. Um, and particularly when we've done workshops or even um, things like negotiation training, mm -hmm. that actually um, women seem to do seem to do incredibly well. But if they lack confidence, their results aren't aren't as good despite being capable if not more capable and qualified so when it comes to imposter syndrome it definitely seems to be having uh, a more of a i'd say a noticeable impact in the results of yeah. the the women that women show um even if they aren't suffering as as or suffering just as much as as the men are it doesn't seem to sort of affect the output as much or from from what from what we've seen but what i would say is that digital it seems to be um not as bad as other industries that i have that i have worked in such as um say law medicine um other areas of tech mm. and and also other um sort of male dominated industries But it's imposter syndrome is definitely something that that affects everyone across the board, re regardless of gender, age, everything. Yeah, and it seems like they are sometimes too too modest, you know, um, that you think, hey, you are so great and um, you know so much, so just say to the world. But it's, uh, I mean, you're not in the role, and it's really hard from the outside to. Um, so, so what tools? Do you give the managers on the hand in order to somehow to to deal with this? No, that's a really good point. So, I mean, the the confidence the confidence building is is really important. With the communication again, really important as as we've already identified, but also this this idea of trying building up personal resilience for the person, so that when they when they have a challenge that approaches them or they have these sort of inner critic voices we have training on how to tackle your inner critic how to how to have a more mm, a more median view of yourself and 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 sort of adjust the thoughts that are that are saying that you're not good enough essentially because that's the phrase that underlines underlines saying you're not good enough And in terms of the resilience training, that could be anything from like we've got a traffic light system, a traffic light system sandwich for when you're dealing with your day to make sure that your uh, emotional capacity and your uh, your mental capacity doesn't dip too low when you're going throughout the day. That there's a goal split mountain depending on how you feel on a day, like so that you're still accomplishing your goals and still moving forward. And loads of different practical tools just to be able to, it could be anything from something that's based on traditional sort of CBT therapy mm -hmm. all the way through sort of mind and body practices um, and everything in between, which is why uh, Torah is a little bit different in, in our approach because it's a sociological approach rather than a, a economics or traditional business coaching approach. Yes, that makes up a big, a big element of it, but we still have... Mm -hmm your therapy, your cognitive behavioral therapy th practices, we've got mind and body techniques, a little bit of military training in there as well. So it's all a, a great mix and we apply what's going to work for the individual, but also for the the overall goal of the company and the team as a whole. So when I would book you, how would how would it look like? Like I spot I have somehow a communication issue in, in my team. Mm. I see that communication isn't so great. So How would you tackle this? So how would the process look like? That's a really good question. So we tend to get 
two types of companies. So we've got mm -hmm. one comp one type of company that will come to us and they say, I don't know, um, for example, uh, Adobe came to us last month and said, oh, we've got mm -hmm. a female leadership team. We want you to arrange um, some workshops on confidence and imposter syndrome to be part of that, to be part mm -hmm. and, and add to that. And go, Absolutely, that's fine. We, we can do that. They know what they want. When it, uh, our company will come to us and say, in this example, we've got some communication issues. We, we, we think that that's the problem. Um, we, we want to see what's going on. So first of all, we do a discovery phase and that could be anything from in, internal surveys or using perhaps the surveys you already you already use. Perhaps you're signed up to the happiness index or ENPS score system, something okay. and we'll add to that and see what's going on. And then also if it's appropriate, conduct in-face interviews with, with your team to, to see and, and confirm the diagnosis basically. Confirm, is it communication issue? What's going on? Um, and then from there, work with you, work with your team to produce, whether it is one-to-one -one training, seminars, workshops, online, face-to-face, -face, how we're going to tackle this, how we're going to implement. There is also an element of potential restructure in there as well. How are you doing your performance interviews? How are, what is the management flow like? How, what is the setup and, and the layout of your team internally? How, how are those processes working? What are the processes? And mm -hmm. it could just be a matter of, of tweaking. It could just be a matter of teaching better communication. It could just be creating a better flow. Or it could be a complete relook at how you measure performance into much more of a of a well being centered performance metric rather than a just pure numbers and figures. Yeah, and that's so generally depends. the process. So as I understood, depends on the discovery session, what comes out, and also what um, the agency owner or the the client wants at the end. Um, because, for example, if I would be in Bucharest, you're in the UK, probably it would be more digital instead of like face to face. Um, but as I understood, you adapt then the, the methods and uh, the tools in order to Absolutely. make it work. Yeah, it's got to be a, it's got to be completely adaptable because although the method is is relatively the same and we're, we're looking at this all from a sociological approach, people are very different. Every agency is different. And yes, every agency may have communication challenges, but those challenges are going to, going to be bespoke and unique to each agency, agency owner and their situation and where they want their business to go ultimately. Yep, yep. I fully, fully agree with you. One one thing I maybe can add what, for example, what yeah, personally right. would help for me um, in order to to build up confidence, because we had this before, it's like words of affirmation. Um, yeah. This is something everybody do. And um, it's so easy to be said, hey, you did a great job. I'm really proud of what you did. But lots of managers don't use this, including me, myself. I mean, I, I had to read several books in order to um, understand um, there are some people, I'm not saying everybody is likes words of affirmation or needs words of affirmation, but uh, a lot of a lot of people i mean when you say something especially as the boss like wow you did a great job um they really take it to the heart and they're really happy when they hear this and it's just so so easy i mean mm, without a doubt i mean that's a really good point about when we're talking about sort of like bringing in mind and body techniques into this as well because when you yeah. talk about mind, words of affirmation you're talking about um the idea of the of the love languages but they they that's a sort of a of the personal relationship thing that's but feeds very much into business and just the way that people like to receive praise and it could be anything from like some people have and what motivations are like are they motivated by money or do they just want to receive um a, a well done but in front of everyone do they want a private yeah. well done and that's that's something that we would find out within the interviews if that was important to you think okay I want to find out how my team are motivated that is one of the questions that we would then ask so that they have basically this this great big sheet of all of their team and oh well Sandra's done a really great job this month how does she like to be motivated she would like a bunch of flowers like there there you go and you've got it's yeah, almost like a cheat, a cheat sheet yep yep
I, I fully agree. I mean, there are the small things that can also um, help to have a great effect on, on individual team members. But I mean, also the manager needs to realize um, what works for whom. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Really, really important. Um, and this is something that I've spoken about when, we, when I've done um, keynotes in the, the performance consultancy industry, as we know at the moment, I personally feel needs a bit of a shake up because you have incredible companies out there that, that manage performance or, mm. or help companies with their performance. Generally, they're more from a, a sort of a business coaching, economics, finance point of view. And they'll have a big long list of, oh, we've, we've worked with this Olympian and we've worked with such and such football team and we've worked with such mm. and, you know, we've got these people to the Premier League. And, and you have to sort of sit back and say, yeah, most companies don't operate in this way most teams they're not they're not looking to win dear sandra doesn't want to win the premier league she yep. she wants she wants to come to work she wants to do a good job she wants a good work life balance and and go home and see her family so bringing in structures and plans and and training that teaches every single member of your team as though they want to win an olympic gold medal doesn't yeah. doesn't work because that's not that's not their goal so we've got it that's why we do the discovery phase we've got to find out what those goals are and how to motivate those people so that you end up with a great team full of motivated people that to be honest after that the work kind of takes care of itself and the growth takes care of itself because you've got a team that wants to get it there Awesome. I think these are nice words to close our conversation about resilience and well-being. Um, any other things, topics you want to share? I mean, wow. Well, uh, any any topics? I want to share at the moment. The next the next study that's taking place is on jealousy and, and workplace envy. We're going to be okay. doing a partnership. Yeah, very interesting, very interesting, because people don't really talk about it, but it causes so many internal conflicts. So um, we're going to do it. We're doing a partnership with the Happiness Index, and there's going to be uh -huh. a, um, a, a podcast coming out on that next uh, next month. So, yeah, a really, really interesting um, and a unique perspective on, on that. And uh, otherwise, um, yeah, Luigi, I don't know what to say. <laughs> I mean, how, how, how can all the, how how can how can people find you? I mean, on your website, Toa Agency. Yes, so we we are Toa Group, uh, toagroup.co.uk, or please connect uh -huh. with me on LinkedIn as well. Awesome. We will also put the links, of course, in the description for people that wanna um, contact you or saying after this, hey, I wanna no more also curious for our viewers and listeners maybe you have some ideas like what i just gave a little words of affirmation maybe you have some other tricks and advices just put them in the comments and yeah it was great to show um maybe next time after you conducted the, the new, new research and we can speak about this topic because it also sounds really really interesting um thank you um for being in my show and have a wonderful day, Amy. You're very welcome. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you. Bye, guys.